Hi, welcome to the final session of this webinar, Men's Health Champions, the Sector Connector. In this final session of the day, we're going to be asking, where's men's health going? What's men's health going to look like in 10 years time? Uh, joining me, we have a fantastic panel to round the day off. We have Jeremy Forbes from Holt. We have Tom Harkin from Tomorrow Man. We have Nick Sutherland from MindFit and the Woke Blokes podcast and John Milham from Mentoring Men. Now, before I introduce you to each of the speakers and give them a chance to tell you a little bit about them, if you don't know already, um, let me just set the context. We've been in this conversation since 9.30 this morning and our first panel was looking back at the last five years, though we had our president, Greg Milan, give a talk with his own reflections of his time in the men's health sector, which date back, dates back 50 years. So we've gone on a real uh, time travel today. So we've looked back 50 years, particularly the last five years. We spent time in the breakout rooms, really looking at different ways that the men's health sector can grow and evolve and get stronger. Uh, and now we're going to have a conversation, uh, gazing into our crystal balls, looking ahead uh, to 2030 and asking, where is men's health heading? And we're asking that from two angles, really. One is, you know, what will the state of men's health be like in 10 years time? Will, will, will men be healthier? Will we have less suicide? Will we be living longer? Will we have stronger relationships? Will we be better dads? Will uh, the boys that come out of school have a different perspe perspective of life and different opportunities and different ways of expressing themselves and, and being men? So there's lots of ways we could look at the question of, of, of men's health, because when we talk about men's health, we're not just talking about cancer and diet and, and, and suicide. We're talking about all of men's lives, uh, that all those things that shape their health and well-being. But we're also, when we talk about men's health, we're also talking about the men's health sector. We're talking about the amount of funding that goes into men's health work. We're talking about the policies that government puts in place. And we, we're talking about the types of programmes and services and projects that are available to men in different regions, at different ages, different populations of men, different stages of life. So when we say those two words, men's health, there are many different directions we can go in. And we probably don't have time, even in 75 minutes, to cover all of it. But we've got four blokes who are going to give it a really good crack. <laughs> so I'm going to start off with a really tough question, which is basically, tell us who you are and why what you do is so awesome. So a really tough question to start off with. And, and a man who I'm going to put right on the spot and see if he's up to the task. It's, it's a man of few words normally, but I'm sure he'll, um, he'll, sure he'll have a go. Jeremy Forbes of Holt. Who the hell are you and what is it you do for men's health? Um, good, um, afternoon, evening, morning, I forget. But anyway, hi, Glenn and everyone out there. And please, thank you. It's been a huge day. Uh, Jeremy Forbes from Holt. So I founded Holt uh, in 2013, Hope Assistance Local Tradies. We're a health promotions charity that fo focuses on uh, the blue collar worker. I did that for a lot by myself. And then we were lucky enough to get a couple of million from the federal government to start building a national program. So now we've got eight staff on board and we're smashing it and loving it and getting to those hard to reach guys at council depots, trade stores, industrial estates and to apprentices at TAFEs. That's what we do. A bit of grassroots, blue collar out in the suburbs, boots on the ground stuff, Glenn. Beautiful. Thanks, Jeremy. That's a good start. We've got a good sense of who you are and we'll be coming back to you soon with some slightly more difficult questions for you to deal with. I'm going to just go across my screen. So, and so you know, it's going to go Nick, John, Tom, because that's where you are on my screen. So uh, Nick Sutherland, same difficult question. Who the devil are you, sir? And what do you do for men's health? Who am I? Jeez, I've been trying to figure that out for 43 years. Um, uh, I'm just a conscious awareness of my thoughts and feelings, Glenn. That's that's basically it. Oh, I, I'm, I'm a lived experience mental health practitioner, so I'm ex-military. Um, had uh, a lot of experiences through there, which I sort of came out of pretty banged up mentally and physically. Um, hit a couple of rock bottoms, worked my way out of them. I um, was very fortunate to get into a space where I could then uh, help other people. Um, so we've been doing that. 
under the umbrella of MindFit. Um, so teaching people how to get their mental health in shape and how to keep it there. Um, we use a combination of psychotherapy and Buddhist and Stoic philosophies, um, as well as the lived experience. Um, yeah, so basically our, our whole thing is is teaching people that A, we all have mental health, B, there's things that we need to do to get in shape, and C, there's a lot of things we can proactively do to look after it and, and keep ourselves well. So that's 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 me. That's brilliant. Nick, thanks for that succinct introduction. I thought we were going for a three-hour philosophical exploration of, uh, of who we really are then. Um, should know in this space that who are you is not a it's not a simple question, but uh, you got it back on track. Thank you. And John Millen, if it's uh, if it's not a deep philosophical question, who who, who are you, John? I'll try to. And I'll try. What are you doing? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Glenn and gents. Um, I'll try to and ladies, of course. I'll try to um, keep the philosophy for later uh, after six o'clock when something colds in our hands. But who am I? Uh, well, I am a corporate escapee and uh, consequently a passionate advocate for building a better myself. And through that kind of feeling from lived experience and uh, you know a sense of privilege through survival, build, helping other men build themselves better as well. So, And we do that through mentoring men and other organisations that are about supporting one-on-one -on -one through peer connection and peer support programs. So that, uh, you know, uh, while we might not be therapists, our conversations and our connection can be therapeutic. And I think that's one of the missing elements of, of looking after each other in the community. And that's what I try to do every day. That's awesome. It. Beautiful. Thanks, John. And, and last but not least, um, we'll come to you, Tom. Tom, how do you want to take on this tough question? <laughs> Thanks, Glenn. I almost uh, forgot that I had to speak for a moment there. I was just enjoying uh, listening. Um, I, I think our work relates a lot to, I mean, you know, all of the guys that have spoken, but um, particularly John, as you were just talking. Um, I uh, feel very lucky to have had the opportunity to um, start Tomorrow Man. Um, so we work across school sporting clubs male dominant workplaces basically wherever blokes will gather um we're willing to turn up and and run workshops and the aim of the workshops tomorrow man's just a big question mark what does it mean to be a man today and what do we think it's going to mean tomorrow again we don't presume to be experts um and to have a silver bullet solution but definitely think that guys have got to get together and have more honest dialogues about how the current state of man is going for them and whether they want to change things, particularly in their communities and peer groups. Um, and so we look to, you know, disrupt, you know, na narrow stereotypes and, and build emotional muscle. And together through the dialogues that we have in the exploration, try and define a healthier expression of masculinity for ourselves and, you know, the people we live with and, and love. I think at its heart, it's about the doing. I think a lot of awareness has been raised, but um, unfortunately too often we're in rooms with guys and there's honest dialogue going on and they're seeing men talk honestly, emotionally, vulnerably, talk about some of the challenges they're facing and the opportunities. And too often the other guys are saying, I've never been in a room where guys have spoken like this. Um, and so we just feel this needs to be more training grounds where guys can, you know, witness and get on the tools and experience, um, you know, talking differently, uh, potentially expressing their masculinity differently um, so that they've got the muscle memory to do that out in the real world, particularly in the moments that matter, the big moments. So um, we work across Australia mainly. That's what we're trying to do out there. Great. Uh, thanks, Tom. And what you've done there as well is remind us and introduce a, a, a third way of looking at men's health. So we've got men's health as a set of um, issues that men and boys as a population face, suicide, life expectancy, workplace death, violence, these types of things. Uh, we've got the men's health as the sector. There's those of us who are doing the work. Uh, and, and, but then you've also got the culture 
around men's health. And that's, I think, what you pointed to, the experience of being a man in uh, in 2021. So focusing in on that, and um, I think I'm let, I, you, you, can, you can cut the pie which, whichever way you want. I'm going to go across the panel and, and in the same sort of uh, order again uh, and just get your view of what do you think the state of men's health is right now? And you can focus on specific issues, the culture around men and men's health, or actually the sector that we're all part of, or a little bit of a little bit of everything. And take it take three or four minutes if you want to really dive into that question. Starting with them um, with, with you, Jeremy. State of men's health in 2021. Ah, I get first response to all these, do I? No, I'm mixing up after this. No, no, that's fine. Um, no, no, <laughs> I'm a ranger, mate. I can handle anything. Um, what was the question again? Yeah, oh, state, no, I'm only joking. State of men's health in 2021. <laughs> um, <clears throat> state of men's health. Uh, I won't say it's neglected. I, I would think it's getting better. I think we're reaching that point where there's this massive campaign around raising awareness, and I'd like to think we're almost past that. I'd like to think we're almost past that and into the educational factor, the stuff that the Tomorrow Man's doing and the stuff on the ground and tweaking that culture. Yes, because that culture, and I work in the blue-collar culture, mate, and I tell you what, it's frigging rough, and I'm going into places like industry. You want to talk about changing the culture, we talk, which I think you need to, and it all fits in together, Glenn, is that we go into industrial estates, um, and, I, and, and anyone have ever, ever guessed? And industrial estates are huge, yeah? People know what they are. Big industries in there, yeah? We're talking hundreds or tens of thousands of workers. Can anyone guess um, how many people have gone into those industrial estates and talked about mental health? Anyone? <laughs> Zero. We are losing. Yes. So we talk about on the ground, part of what Holt does, and what I did when I was, was just me doing Holt, was walking into it, getting, parking the ute in the corner of an industrial estate, walking in with something and then whatever, and then going into each of those businesses and introducing myself and either being told to F off, uh, and this continues, or what are you trying to sell? What are you trying to do? What do you mean? There's nothing like that here, although we've had four suicides in the last three years. This place is cursed. Um, our, or into they're, they're sitting there smoking bongs, drinking Woodstocks, like all this sort of stuff. You talk about changing culture. And then we have conversations with them. And then they go, oh, can you come and speak to our workers now? Can you talk now? We'll get them together and talk now. Can you come back next week? And we just, with Halt, we just try and change a bit of the culture. So instead of the you'll be right, she'll be right, which is across the blue collar workers, yeah, a lot of blue collar workers in 2021, as you'll be right, she'll be right. So we just try and change a bit of that, tweak a bit of that with the, you know, maybe we should go to the doctors. We find support services, how to be a good listener and uh, how to have the tough conversations. So for us, we see it changing. Uh, as to what needs to happen, we'll get to that. I'll let someone else speak, Glenn. But it's slowly changing, but we can only do the awareness raising for so long before we have to step into the educational on a grassroots level. It's nothing's going to change. And I'm going to go right off at some stage today about the need for grassroots intervention and community as one of the only ways, I think, to reducing it. I need to stop now. I'm going to get worked up, Glenn, and I'm going to bust, okay. I'm going to bust the pooper valve. Okay, <laughs> hold your fire, do some deep breathing. We'll come back to you, Jess. <laughs> so nice. So, 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 Nick, too much of raising aware, too, too much, too much awareness. We need more education. Um, things are getting better. What, what do you think? Are you, are you with Jess? You got some, have you got more to add to that? Yeah, no, I'm I've been on that wagon for a couple of years, I think. This everyone knows the stats. Everyone has been drilled in the time and time again. I think I think too much awareness. It starts to become part of the issue. To be honest, I, I look at people's capacity. I never look at people in any sort of judgment or anything. And essentially, we're all doing the best we can. We only know what we know. We've been handed it down from generation to generation will be conditioned to it you know it's it's not a, a primary focus um in schools which it really needs to be but yeah i think the more we can educate you know uh, mandela said that knowledge is the greatest weapon we have in which to change the world uh, but it needs to be the right knowledge and then that knowledge 
needs to be turned into wisdom through application. We need to we need to learn what to do and then actually action that um, ourselves. So, from my perspective, I think yeah, we have as many problems as we think we have. So, I mean, I, I like to be glass half full. I think from our perspective three years ago 30 percent of our clients were male 70 percent were women and that's done a complete 180 now we've got 70 percent men 30 percent women um most of those are tradies in the 30 to 40 age bracket which is amazing uh, we've got a couple of 70 year olds coming in doing the work uh, we've got a couple of 18 year olds coming in doing the work so i mean i think the signs are really bright mate i think it's we're, we're trying to take people away from needing therapy i think that's probably a barrier and that's what we really need to do is remove all the barriers to, to men getting healthier whether it be mental or physical and for the mental health it's um blokes just don't like therapy and i don't think the clinical psychology is helping um people in a way that it probably once was um so we're just talking about we're healing if you've been through a trauma we're going to do some healing but then we need to do some education and so for us that's sort of where the landscape is um what we're focused on and is is yeah just taking the blindfold off people it's like you want to be happy no one knows what the hell happiness is um or what to do in order to become happy so let's just start there and figure out the rest all right thanks nick i'll move to you john what's your take on the state of men's health in in in, in 2021 yeah and it's uh, it's great to hear those ideas i couldn't you know i'm i'm fully on board with you with you guys already but um it's interesting you know the idea is there are many i love that there's many as many problems as we want them to be i i i always got the impression it's always in my head the picture of of uh you know the guy with the plates on the stick right and you know it doesn't matter how many he puts up he's going to have to run around and keep them spinning and that's the sense right you if you if, you know men are so you you know integrated to the to the f effective working of society that when men go wrong a whole bunch of stuff goes wrong like the whole place is like you get you know and you you mentioned it going parenting and work and you know bullying and you know um and, and men's health and stuff everything's going wrong the answer you know we, and we can run around putting our fires out and that's i think what we've done right up, up to this point and i it's now time uh to do it differently and we're starting to do it differently and it's because the men on the ground are saying it ain't working you're missing it and so blokes uh like the wonderful groups that are represented here are starting to step up and change things right now it's a, a big job because we're you know pushing the these great logs out of the way and we're trying to you know work on on the bit of ground that we that we you know clear in front of us right so we're all clearing our own backyards and and doing what we can there and then some great groups like tomorrow man and others are are starting to reach out and get uh, you know clear it work with other people in other backyards which is really exciting so i see where we are now is like up until now despite the best efforts of the system we are making a difference but we're making a difference kind of one or some men right so we're reaching one or some our next challenge is to is to work together right and work smart and start to pull the forces together to start to get to many or all men right and i don't you know like and that starts with you know young blokes and it starts with rites of passage and it starts with blokes who are in the trades and then it starts you know fighting the corporate psychopaths all of those things have to be um you know part of our gear our our um uh, our landscape but you know not one of us has that job all of us do right and it's really where i get is i get really excited when i see so many like-minded individuals with so much power on the ground and say well i'm going to work with them and i'm going to take care of my bit and they're going to help me take care of other bits and we're going to get there so that we get moved from a model where uh all men are exposed to being to the tools and resources they need rather than that so that that's the rule rather than the exception right so we only lose a few because they just missed out not because we lose many because you know there isn't anyone to to look after them or help them 
So, yeah, that's where I see we are today. And hopefully, and with excitement to look at, you know, move into the future. That's great, John. Thank you. And thanks for sort of highlighting the vibrancy at a, at a grassroots level. The session before uh, we had uh, Melissa, the founder of Top Blokes, who you know was founded 15 years ago, yeah. talking about when she first was talking to people about getting funding for or the need for projects and services for young men that people just laughed at her. Yeah. The, the very idea that there would even, there was even a need for it to do anything because, you know, it, it's not that the issues weren't there, but it's that people had a very strong belief. Well, that's just, you know, that's just blokes being blokes. Young blokes have got no one but themselves to blame. That's just the way young blokes are. They need to smarten up their ideas. They don't need services and projects. Yeah. They need to, they need to like, they need to sort themselves out. So, so there's definitely been a shift, um, shift there. So there's an excitement there. Uh, from from my perspective, but um, that's me. I'm chairing. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm jumping in too much. I want to know what you've got to <laughs> say, um, Tom. What, what, what's your take on the on the state of uh, of, of men's men's health in 2021? Um, yeah, I mean, I, there's a, a lot of great thoughts have already been shared, um, and I kind of uh, echo some of your thinking, Glenn. Like, um, I think there are a lot of sparks of excitement um you know some really positive changes and then like any kind of complex systemic change there's a lot of stuff that can get you down where you feel like is it really changing or is it changing fast enough or significantly enough um you know i think when you think about what the aspiration is you know jeremy you talk about you know, being a pioneer and going into those spaces where, you know, nobody's walked in there yet to have those conversations. And so they're thinking they're being sold to and there's defense or there's F off or whatever it might be. Um, I think that there's a lot of kind of pioneering movement going on. As John, you spoke about, there's a lot of people doing stuff around the fringes. Um, and I kind of agree, like the, the hope, I guess, is that, it, this work, you know, with men, giving them the tools and competencies they actually need to live different lives so that the stats change around harm to themselves and harm to others becomes the norm rather than the exception. At the moment, we've got to admit that it's the exception. Mm -hmm. Kind of look around, you see pockets of great work being done, but it's not a normalised, uh, integrated part of the way every boy grows into a man in our society. We're so far from that, um, yeah. from putting it into the existing, you know, education streams and, you know, the journey of a, you know, a, a boy going into a, you know, a sporting journey from, you know, youth to adulthood or whatever it might be. So I feel like there's a real need to make all of us redundant, you know, <laughs> And, and I really hope in, you know, 2030 or beyond at some point we look back and we go, Remember when it was an exception where we had all these little, you know, agitating organizations trying to raise the flag for a different type of masculinity and, and, and get into a school year to implant this workshop as an intervention rather than, hey, that's just the way that we grow up as men now. We grow up to realize that we don't need to be stuck in a narrow cage of masculinity. We can have a range of expression um, and... I don't think we're there yet. And then I guess like putting where the state of, of men's health is at, I'm sure that it's come up multiple times over the last, you know, couple of days, you, you know, we, we lose a man in this country every four hours, you know? So, you know, today we'll have lost a few men, mm. um, six, you know, throughout the 24 hours. And, 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 and that's not okay. You know, We've heard a lot about the stats that are going on in terms of the way that, um, you know, as John was talking to, when, it, when, a, when a man goes down, um, unfortunately, he takes a lot of people with him and sometimes it's the people that he loves the most. And we've seen too many of those horrific stats around as well. And so I think about what are the forces, the, the macro forces that are pulling on men throughout the coming years. And I think that, you know, there is a, 
a, a, a really important um, shift happening in terms of gendered roles. Um, you know, women are continuing to take a more equal position in our society and it's far from there, but it's needed. Um, it, it's, it's the healthiest outcome for all of us. But given that men have held so much of that space over the last, you know, we'll talk 50 to 100 years, there's, there's a sense of loss in that. There's a loss of the previous value that men offered society and the role that they played. And so in that loss, how are we teaching guys to grieve and how are we teaching guys to handle change, to reimagine uh, the role that they play and where they add value to society because that's not going to stop changing. And even like to kind of go really out there, if we're talking futuristic, um, there, there, there will be a point in the not too distant future where where brawn, uh, you know, lean muscle is no advantage whatsoever economically where we just don't need anybody to heavy lift anything because we've got all the machinery and automation to do that work. Now, you know, I have arguments about when that's going to come, but it's, it, that, that will be the first time in the history of humanity where that, that extra muscle or that extra advantage, you know, really has worth. And so you kind of ask yourself, if you take that out of the, out of the equation entirely, where do you earn economic status? And how and what are the jobs? Are they more creative? Are they more, you know, entertaining feminine aspects of innovation and empathy and connection and all of those kind of pieces? So I think that um, exciting things are happening. I think that it's too much around the fringes. It's not at the core. Um, And as Jeremy said, it's not being taken up at the grassroots level. I think we're still waiting for the cavalry. And we're waiting for, you know, educational reform and all those kind of things. I think it's, we're going to be waiting a, a lot longer. But then also looking at what are, what are the bigger forces that are shaping the, the life that guys are coming into? Um, and how do we set them up with the right competencies for the place a man is going to find himself in society in 10 years' time, which will look vastly different to my dad's generation? and the competencies that they needed to be of value and have purpose and contribute in that society. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thank, thanks, Tom. You've covered a, a whole range of different topics in a couple of minutes there and opened up many potential um, pathways for conversation. Um, one thing that really resonated um, for me was about, you know, the, the future, the future economy, the future, the, fu- the future workplace. I remember being at um, a, a boys conference, no, oh, no, maybe four years ago, and I think it was the um, the CEO of possibly Google, one of the big tech, possibly Google in Australia mm-hmm. and New Zealand, who had two young boys, and she was doing some, you know, some 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 forward forward looking. What would the future look for, look like for boys? And, and and one of the things that she said is, it's really hard to know what skills to give to our boys because most of the jobs they'll do in five or ten years' time don't exist today. Mm. and so that therefore um therefore we don't even know what skills what specific skills to give them but what we do need is we need we need to, to teach them to be adaptable and flexible and relational and all these things so that they can adapt to whatever the future is mm. so and, and that's a, that's a sort of a um a stepping stone in, into my next question and and, and, and jeremy jeremy I'm not going to come to you. We're going to mix it up now. So keep breathing, my friend. Keep breathing. Um, I'm going to. <laughs> I um, I'm going to ask you now all to future days a little bit. Um, don't go any further than 2030. It's, it's it's a long way away, but again, it's only nine years, right? It's only nine years. So let's be realistic in terms of um, what what can and will be achieved in nine years' time. Um, but from any angle you want to look at it from, what what's men's health going to look like in in nine years? So I'm, I'm going to throw a piece in, which which is my, my sort of one of my areas of concern, which is like policy and strategy. And having just had the, the, the budget papers come out yesterday with an announcement of around 500 million being spent on women's health, which is fantastic. But only one million dollars in the in, in the in the budget spending was allocated to a specific men's health initiative, right? So, without wanting to get into a battle of you know women's health funding versus men's health funding, that takes us nowhere. What I would like to see in ten years' time is it's the norm 
for for governments of all of all political colours, whether that's sort of federal or state, just a bit just to stand up and say, look, you know, we take the lives of men and boys uh, uh, and their health seriously, uh, and and this is what we're going to be doing uh, this year. That it'll be under the norm for politicians to stand up and invest in policies and funding that's designed to support and improve and, and help men's lives. That's not the norm right now at a political level. That's what I'd like to see in, in nine years' time. Nick, I'm going to come to you first, and you can slice men's health however you want to slice it. Um, where do you think we could be in nine years' time, 2030? Wherever we guide it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <Actually>. next. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, no, okay. well, where would you to, like us to go? Where do you, where do you think it's possible that we will guide it? What do you think? Yeah. I, I guess I need to preface things. I'm coming at things from a, a psychotherapy perspective. I'm, I'm, I'm coming at it from the practitioner level. So, um, you know, we talk about the core and grassroots and everything, but, you know, we can't have peace on earth until we have peace within ourselves and blah, blah, blah. I'm just wondering how, how can you expect guys to be able to function and contribute in all these components of their lives when so many are struggling to function properly within the themselves every single client that i see is employing so many critical thinking errors cognitive distortions everyone's walking around in such a heightened state because they can't process things they don't know how they're feeling i've got a cushion here that i had to buy with a wheel of emotions on it every time i ask someone in a session how they're feeling they, the usual response is good i'm like okay good's not an emotion <laughs> let's let's actually teach you what you're feeling and a bloke the other day said um after a while he goes i'm feeling disgust and sad i'm like fucking beautiful let's run with that and let's and the whole session just evolved from there but he had no idea of what it was that he was sitting in so there you know so many men want to talk they want to express they want to communicate but they're stifled because they don't actually know what it is that they're doing. So hopefully in nine years time, Glenn, blokes, you know, our whole thing is emotional intelligence. Hopefully we can get blokes being more self-aware and when they're self-aware, they can then self-manage and self-regulate and then they can have social awareness and then they can look around and be there for other people and then they can have a healthy relationship management. So for me, the core starts at the very centre of who we are and how we're all operating as individuals and taking responsibility for our own, in my world, mental health and well-being. Because, yeah, we can't ask them to be good fathers or good workers or good husbands or good anything until they're okay within themselves. So for me, the, the key really comes down to yeah, just increasing and developing that emotional intelligence. Because if they're in suffering, if they're you know, constantly heightened in the state of fight, flight, if they're in their sympathetic nervous system all the time, just cortisol and adrenaline pumping through their systems, they're not actually speaking from their authentic self. They're speaking from a heightened state and they're speaking from their anger or their anxiety or their guilt or, or, or their depression. Um, and there's a lot people can do to reduce all of that unnecessary suffering. So I think state on an individual level and teach people how to self-manage, uh, um, then, you know, we won't need to rely on such a huge system. I think you're from, you know, these resources, but I think there's a lot that we can do within ourselves to take a bit more ownership and, um, so by yeah, nine years' time, I'd just love to see a landscape where things like this aren't needed. You know, it's it's just such a simple little tool, but it's amazing how many people sit there and they'll stare at it for five minutes and I go, oh, is that, is that a feeling? Is, is, okay, right. So I don't know there's a lot of ignorance and that's not a judgment. It's just a, it's just a, it's just a fact. There's a lot of ignorance, a lot of misunderstanding, a lot of um people trying their absolute best but it's like they're trying to run a hundred meter race with an 80 meter rope tied around their waist you know and they just they just can't quite get there because they're missing very vital self-management tools so i don't know i mean yeah i, I can only speak from my little yeah 
sector. And for me, it's just trying to empower people with those tools and resources to better um, operate in a healthier um, and f- manner and function on a on a more calm and even keel. And, and to man. manage when life and um, manage whenever life happens because we can't control it. There, we can only choose how we feel. So just to to manage when the when the storms roll in. Yeah, no, that's that's fantastic, Nick. I mean, you could have a whole day on just that topic. Thank you. I'd love one. Thanks. <laughs> and let's do it. We'll open up the Zoom room on Saturday for you and see how you go. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm there. Yeah, but seriously, you could. Because uh, you, you're, what you're painting is a picture of a world in 10 years' time where, where our society, our community is much more emotionally intelligent, where emotional intelligence is embedded into every aspect of our, of our lives and therefore men and boys by default are more emotionally in, in, intelligent. We could, we could explore the vision of that. What does it look like uh, in a world where, where men and boys are better able to recognise and understand and label and express and regulate their emotions but then the question would be, well, how do we do that? What's the role of schools? What's the role of the workplace? How does that show up in relationships? How does that show up in, in, in our friendships? So there's a, there's a whole world there we could explore, but we've only got an hour, so we'll move on. Uh, and I will come back to Tom on your thoughts. Uh, Tom and then John and then, and then Jess. Yeah, thanks, Glenn. Um, I, I mean, again, I, I kind of want to pick up where where Nick's talking from, like if if we don't um, if we don't educate and give the competencies to young 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 boys and men, then it's really hard to change the face of men's mental health. Um, and it takes us back to the beginning of the conversation. We can talk about awareness, but awareness, you know, is is fairly useless unless you have the competency to understand the nature of your own self. I think that we're starting to come to a point with education where we're realising that an education system built for the industrial age where you teach people to learn and memorise something and then spit it back out because that's the answer and you just need to execute that answer is becoming redundant. And so we are starting to realise that education needs to teach people how to adapt and learn and evolve because change is happening faster and faster. And we know that changing and evolving requires emotional intelligence. You actually need that kind of, you know, teach a man to fish type, you know, mentality to go, okay, if we know the world's probably going to look pretty different in 20 years for a kid that's starting education, then let's not try and teach them what's in the books today because the books are probably going to look differently in 20 years or there will be no books. And so let's actually teach them to learn and evolve to be able to understand what it's like to learn and evolve, to realise that the way that I've operated up until now no longer serves me and I actually just need to, you know, shift some of my DNA in terms of my behavioural DNA and, and and go through that process of, okay, I thought a man was this and now I'm evolving my understanding of it because the world's changing around me and that's okay. That doesn't mean that I've lost my sense of self. It just means that the way that I express myself has evolved and changed. So I feel like, again, it, maybe it just feels like repetition, but our institutions of education, whether they're family lounge rooms or schools or sporting clubs or the cultural rhetoric that comes through our TVs and radio, it, it, needs, it needs to shift and change so that, so that we can evolve our understanding. I think young people are a huge hope as well. Mm. Like we're out in schools And, you know, we need to continue to evolve our understanding as an organisation working with a lot of young people. And some of them are coming along and they're kind of going, what is this binary language you guys are using? How old school that you've called your business tomorrow, man, or you've called your business tomorrow, woman? It's old school. You know, this binary thinking is so limited and dated. And my hope is that by 2030, we're looking back and we often talk about our own organisation. We hold the name of our organisation lightly. At the moment, it helps us to go through that binary lens and then expand from there. But we're up for ditching it with the times, you know, and and hopefully, you know, in 2030, the young people have come through and kind of overthrown this archaic way of looking at gender. And they're going, it can be far more flexible than that. Um, and we've got the emotional intelligence to be able to have range and be flexible in the way that we express. 
had a generation of guys that have just come through and they've taught their dads to say, I love you. Um, what else could be achieved by the future generations that are coming through and forcing change? Um, but I think it needs to happen right. at both sides. Yeah. Grassroots, yes. Yeah. But also we, we have to change the 15 or so years of education yeah. that we lock kids into a classroom for yeah. and not teach them, you know, just how to read books and repeat them, but how to yeah. handle the big moments of life, loss, you know, growth, um, love, rejection, all of those, you know, human elements um, that are about the internal life of somebody and their, their life in relationship with other people. Right. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, it's got to change from every from 360 degrees, right? If we're going to change anything, it's got to change at a relationship level, at a community level, in workplaces and schools. It's got to change from a policy level down and from the grassroots up. And coming back to the grassroots, John, 10 years time, will mentoring men be mentoring people in all their diversity? Uh, where do you see things going? How are we going to get more, more people engaged in doing the helping? Yeah, absolutely. My goodness, there's some great stuff. I just want to explode with you know sort of you know di you know questions and stuff here because it's um, it's interesting. So you know from Nick's point of view, I love that Nick, you're doing triage on on the country, right? So you know men are in pain and you're helping them, and that's beautiful, right? Uh, but that's not the answer to ten years, right? We just don't do them one man at a time. We need to find a way to fix a whole bunch of us, right, systemically, culturally, right? So, you know, and I look at, you know, Glenn, you mentioned the 500 mil and one mil goes to men, and I just go, not again, right? It's it's because um, Nick hasn't reached those blokes who are making decisions about where the money's gone. So they haven't grown up yet. So they look into their own masculinity and say, oh, I, we don't need any help. Give it all to the women, right? So, you know, the reason we're not funded is because we haven't asked for it or we haven't required it, right? We pretend we're actually tough enough without it. So, you know, changing, you know, and then, of course, there's the young men that Tom are working with and seeing every day, and they're the future, but they don't work because they get a great view of, you know, from school or, you know, from Tomorrow Man sessions, and they go home and they're, they're the key person that they look up to for, for guidance in the world will, will be emotionally uh, distant right, or avoidant or painful or giving other even worse behaviours as role mo as uh, examples of how to grow up and be a man. So how do we bring all this together? Well, for me, it's about the community. We change the community. We, we put blokes in, in, in who want to grow. We teach them how to, you know, what we know and share and hope that then they can be role models. And then, you know, and that's done through mentoring and it's done through workshops and it's done through summits where we all have this discussion and go out newly inspired to sort of have quality conversations and share our wisdom and and you know hope that it makes a difference. So I think in 10 years time we will see that difference. I think we'll have reached a tipping point. I think you know, you know, one conversation, two conversations, great men, you know, having hold standing up on a platform and and giving a great example for the world to follow. And as a result, um, we start to make inroads, we get to that level. And then the culture slowly changes. Our politicians are new. They've got new ideas. They've been trained by Tom. You know, they start to, you know, in, introduce policies that are human-centred instead of, um, you know, control or corporate-centred or, you know, you know, about things, you know, dis you know, distanced from people. So once we start to connect with people, we can't avoid them. We, we must look after them, right? It's, it's only the people we don't know that we hate, right, generally. Uh, so, so I think, and I think, you know, also Nick talked about the bottom up, you know, the community, right? That's where our resource is. That's, this is a, this is a, um, a, um, a people's revolution, right? We're going to change the culture um, from the bottom, right? Because we're going to be active and it's going to look like geos, you know, we're going to have these little geographies of, of community inspired people doing amazing things and reaching, you know, and technology will connect us, but we'll still be operating in our own locality. And then, you know, we'll see what everyone else is doing. There'll be a sense of belonging, but actually also tribal senses. And in 10 years, um, the geographies will, will live even more strongly together and more because we'll be at home, right? There's no use to going into an office. <laughs> the, the COVID's changed that. 
So when you walk out of your house and you walk down to the local coffee shop and you see the people you're going to see every day, you're going to feel that connection. And that's going to be a place where we grow and, and support each other. So I think, and that's where the mentoring will happen over a coffee shop or at a scout hall or in a, you know, on the sporting field where our coaches or on the beach or in the, you know, in the fishing, you know, all of these places where men gather, as you said earlier, the, the they'll be, educated and they'll be offering role models and they'll be offering um, behaviours that are, are really transformational for young people and they'll be reinforced by education that is actually self-aware and emotionally intelligent, you know. So that's right. that's the image. I guess it's probably a little bit positive con you know, considering where all the problems ahead of us. But, you know, I, I think we we either, we, either, we either win this comp or die. So... Mm. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. And thanks for introducing the vision of, of stronger tribal, localised communities connected globally by the World Wide Web. It's a very positive uh, vision. You could also, some people would give a very grim vision of that technological world, but you've, you've, you've painted a, a very positive vision. And if you were in the session today on working with men online, you would have seen loads of great examples of how we are connecting really effectively with men online and integrating that with face-to-face -face, face work. So it's not such a kind of like pie in the sky type of vision you're painting. There are certainly some key examples of it out there, but it involves individuals, leaders at a community level, getting out there and making shit happen, which is exactly yeah. what Jeremy Forbes has been doing for the last few years. So in 2020, uh, 2030, Jeremy, do we, do we need like a thousand more Jeremy Forbes? What, what's it gonna look like? Mate, the best gift I gave to you all was making sure I didn't have kids on my 40th birthday. That was the greatest <laughs> gift I gave to mankind. All right, um, th that's it. Thank you very much. So what? Um, so basically, in, in 2030, I want Collingwood to win another couple of premierships, please. I also would like every TAFE, every single TAFE in Australia to have mental health in their curriculum, all right? I want every TAFE, we, we have our building and construction Future of our future builders and construction, tens of thousands of apprentices. I want them to have some knowledge about mental health. Yeah, I don't want them to go. Oh, we'll get halt in me in once a year. I want something in the curriculum to change on a local and state and national level um, and an ongoing basis. Um, those of you that don't know me, um, I, I started halt with not a single cent. All right, but a community need. And in 2019, I was given $2 million by the federal government to start building a national program, all right? Um, what does that mean? That means friggin' there's so many small men suicide prevention groups out there, all right, that should be instantly um, given a million or two million and set up, evidenced, evaluated and expanded and scaled up. Uh, I can think of probably five here immediately because the work that we're doing, you all, you're all doing here, needs to be done in every community. So for the government, they need to get in there, I don't care if it's state or federal, and set up something that if I can do it with me, and I've now got nine people, is that we should be able to scale up, pile it with the support, all these men's suicide prevention groups. We get them to a point where we can then take them all to the communities and say, here's some money. Which one of those organisations do you want to come in our community? How does that happen then in 2030 is that we have, as an example, is that I emailed 40 suicide prevention networks, yeah, across South Australia, 40 of them telling them about HALT and one got back to me, Mount Gambia. I organised to go to Mount Gambia, yeah, and I spent three days there. I did nine events and they said, can you come back in um, a month's time and do 25 events. The expansion and the knowledge and the excitement. And, you know, we need it almost, for want of a better word, um, I'd love to see whether it's Nick, the Tomorrow Man, whether it's, you know, um, Greg was here from Men Care too. We've got the guys from uh, You're OK, Mate, and there's the INAP boys and the Trademark boys and the TX boys and the Mr Perfect stuff. Imagine if all the suicide prevention networks and communities were given $50,000 a year to be able to bring these groups into their communities. Yeah? Thank you. That's fine.
Um, yeah. Glenn, no, seriously, Glenn, that idea of having no, these groups... I don't know. I don't, I'm not quite sure what that heckle was, but let's uh, carry on. <laughs> Buddy and Andy Collingwood supporter, mate. But I'm serious. <laughs> Probably. We talk about community and that funding to give every suicide prevention network in Australia the opportunity to engage in any of our services to help their community. Um, we're not talking a huge amount of money. And to scale every, to scale 30 to 50 men's suicide prevention net groups, organisations, charities, up to a point that if they choose to go national like Holt is, should be a no-brainer, mate. We should be able to get universities on board, anyone on board. Nick's waving at me. Do you want to say something, Nick? Yeah. I'll let you, mate. Come on, brother. Well, it's just to add to it. I don't want to... But in, but you're on fire, Jez. Um, yeah, yeah. I've had the same thing the whole time, and I'm probably going to cut your legs out from under you, Glenn. And uh, you know, a question you can ask later is what are the obstacles? And I think Jez has nailed it. Is there's not enough funding? Like I've been, you know, the train my boys and I did a, a partnership for a while, and you know, I know you and the work you're doing, you're sort of local here, but we're all doing it so individually instead of as a collective. Mm. Um, and I've, I've I've been asked by my clients in Mount Isa and in far north Queensland if I can do a road trip through the outback and just do some you know, presentations. And, and all I'm trying to do is plant seeds of this is what you can do to look after yourselves, you know. Um, but I can't because I'm, I'm running a business in an office and I've got clients to attend to. I've, I've got all these programs, all this information I want to get out there, but I've got no funding to turn it into pro online programs and to put out there. So there's all these barriers to getting the information out there. And I mean, Jez, yeah, did an amazing job of getting funding and I'm, I keep looking at it going, right, well, yeah, I'd love to, but then I'm, I'm, you know, trying to go a couple of different ways. So I, I think you, you yeah. smacked it on the arse there, Jez. Mate, yeah. you, sorry, Glenn, can you imagine, I've got another seven minutes, mate, I just saw it. Can you get, and I'm only joking, <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. so passionate because I frigging, I get communities, I could drop, 50 halt workers across yeah. communities yeah. Um, tomorrow, just in regional Victoria, but we've never had any funding from the state government. I don't know why. Uh, and you, I know you could also drop them in there and raise you know, awareness around it, but then Mindfit could come in and tag on the yes. end of it and, and do the emotional intelligence building. Mate, yeah, could, and uh, could... and their mentoring men could come in and, and give them a longitudinal experience supported by a bloke, right? So you're like, you're absolutely yeah. right. We all we all have. Tom's there, Tom. No, but, 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 we, we joke about it, but that how no, serious. Yeah. Is that like imagine yeah. Yeah. Them going, me going to Man Gambia and saying you should get Nick and the Tomorrow Man and you should get everyone else in because you've got government funding to be able to do that. That's if people choose to you know expand on that national level. But I still think we should all get together and talk about this over a, a nice biscuit. Yeah, we, 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 we should. <laughs> Jess, let me. It's brilliant. Let me put some. Let me put some structure on this because yes. you raise you raise a very serious point and. And, and it is absolutely um, serious. And who can be felt to be inspired by your your, your dynamism? And, and let me put some kind of framework around it. So um, we've just gone through this process. So let's focus on an issue. So I said at the beginning, we can slice it in different ways. We can focus on an issue. We can focus on culture change. We can focus on the sector or even like, you know, the, the, the system. Let's take one issue male suicide. This morning session, we've for the first time done some proper polling research of the Australian public to get a sense of what issues imp impacting men and boys do the public consider to be important. And, and that's important because if we want politicians to take something seriously, we have to show them that there's no risk so that the public supports it. And there's a potential reward. The public might be more likely to vote for them. It's a very cynical way of looking at stuff, but it's how politics works. And the top issues that came up over and over again were mental health and male suicide. And it's really strong. And the public told us 1,250 people done by pollsters who've worked with you know, general election campaigns, these are proper pollsters. Um, they told us that they would support, the public would support additional funding targeted to address specific men's issues, particularly if there were solutions that we could name, right? And so what you're talking about is a whole host of organizations there that bring solutions to the table. So that's piece one. Piece two is that the, um, the National Suicide Prevention Advisor has actually given the government her recommendations. Recommendation seven, target priority population, specifically men, right? Uh, 
in the budget announcement yesterday, we got a long list of stuff and her advice was, was referenced. This bit of funding responds to recommendation one. This bit of funding responds to recommendation two. What was missing was actually an any funding on recommendation seven. So there's a little gap there where we're able to actually go. And we've now got a minister for suicide prevention and we've now got funding for a national suicide prevention office. We as a sector need to be in there together saying, look, the public says it wants you to target stuff. Your, the PM's advisor says you should target men. And what are you going to do? Now, three or four years ago, when the funding went to the primary health networks, 12 primary health networks got national funding, and about half of them were, were asked to target men. And then this other program, the National Leadership Program, gave them a list of organizations that they might, might consider engaging with. Now, I know smaller projects um, got little bits of funding. I know you probably got some funding from PHNs. Some of the work that I've done got some funding from PHNs. But in terms of being advised who to go to, only Mates in Construction and OzHelp were listed as organizations working with men. Look, two great organizations. But what, what we need to give the PHNs is this list of like 50 men's suicide prevention organization and say there's loads of different approaches out there they're scaling up they're doing great they're doing great work whether it's mentoring men or tomorrow man whether it's mind fit whether it's Holt, whether it's man walk mr perfect i know trademark you've uh, dad's in distress working with separated fathers we could list them and go on and on and on we need this is where the sector needs to work together this is where for me in nine years time we need to show that we as a sector, we don't have to agree with each other. This is one of the points that I'm making a lot at the moment is there's a real important speaking together, but it doesn't have to be with one voice. We don't all have to agree. What we have to do is find a ways of speaking in harmony and saying we all agree that seven suicides a day, and Tom, it's seven now, we've gone up. Seven suicides a day yeah, for men yeah. is too many. Yeah. And there are many different ways to solve that, but the, the government has got to take this seriously and actually empower blokes who are stepping up from the grassroots and saying, we want to be part of the solution. And so, you know, I the think, reason- Glenn, you I think you hit the, the nail on the head with diversity and, and there's more than one way to skin a cat. And, you know, a, a lot of people resonate with what Mindsweet doing, but some people don't, you know, and, but a lot of people would resonate with what tomorrow means doing or, you know, mentoring men, or if we can create a bit of diversity in the sector it gives people a choice and it's like a pizza shop everyone loves pizza but you know i don't like that flavor it's got pineapple on it then only psychos eat pineapple on pizza i'm going to go for this one over here so they don't you know i don't have all the answers i don't have the best strategy to i i, I can't end suicide in australia in men's you know but i can do my little bit for those who it resonates with and so can all the all the you know organizations out there so I think if we can have a collective, but but have that diversity within the collective, it'll be really important and really healthy. Mm. I don't think so, um, any of us see ourselves as the answer, right? All of us are the answer, right? So, you know, I love um, putting together, you know, just talking to men's groups in other places where they're doing amazing work. And I go, I see how well you know, other groups would fit into that landscape in that environment, right? And, and so you get an end-to-end -end model. So you're dealing with young men, you're dealing with middle-aged men, you're dealing with fathers, you're dealing with old men. You know, um, you, you, once we have that, the, the, you know, the, the different options, right, we can put a program together that best fits in a, 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 um, a, you know, a town or a sector or an area or a community, and then we just nail it, right? They're like all these blokes would have purpose and, you know, uh, I heard earlier that Omar on the other session, he, he said one, one of the things that, that he looks to do is to change um, hob, pe men uh, getting as much satisfaction about, you know, from volunteering as they do from their hobbies. So then they take their time from their hobbies and then give it to these, these causes. And I'm thinking that's exactly what we need to do. My passion is this. So I spend my time here. How do we get everyone in? to ramp up their passion and bring their time in so we can solve this on a sort of, you know, you know, be an inevitable surge forward from men, you know, like saying, let's get that money and get that funding and yeah. get that job done. You know? Hey, Glenn, can I speak for a minute? Right. Uh, Glenn? 
Yeah, and then I'm going to come to Tom, who's been sitting on the sidelines a little bit. You go ahead, Jeremy. No, no, Tom goes first. No, you, you go ahead. Speak for a minute. Carry on. I don't want to talk now. <laughs> no, no, no. Are you, just finish. Are no, you no, okay? No, I do. I, I just want to finish off with Glenn and I talked about the power of, you know, I don't want to have this conversation with you all next year. All right. I, I do, but I don't. I, I'd love, Glenn and I have talked about the fact of getting together for a day or two of yeah. all sharing ideas and experiences, but also having a way forward of saying, this is how you do it. This is who we see. And I've seen Chris and a couple of other people have already spoken about getting together and having a chat. I think that should be high on the agenda. Glenn, thank you. Signing out. From yeah. Uh, and, and we need to bring people at ministerial level into that conversation so it's not just a conversation in a room over here that it's actually known of and heard at a ministerial level but that's that's the role of you know the australian men's health forum so tom two options here either just bounce off this conversation or take us into the final question which is uh, which is what's going to stop us getting where we want to get to what are the key barriers entirely up to you where you feel 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 you want to go or take both even yeah, thanks, Glenn. It's an awesome conversation just to um, to be a part of, and loving the passion, and you know, just you know, witnessing the bounce off everyone. And I think that um, it's evident just like in the last like 10, 15 minutes how much value comes out of a gathering because this is what this is, you know. Um, people that are passionate, you know, it's a virtual forum. We're on it. We're all you know talking and. Um, how powerful that would be to to put a bit more time into in terms of brainstorming the solutions and the way that collaboration can happen. I think that um, it's interesting listening to it from from my perspective because um, I you know I grew up in the Reach Foundation non for profit organisation um, you know uh, out of Victoria originally, um, but. Kind of my experience there going from a participant to a board member and seeing various ways that organization was funded over time um, has, to be honest, given me a bit of an aversion to government funding um, and the way that government funding can be tied and can be, you know, in one election kind of put towards one thing and then suddenly be turned or the size of the funding. So, you know, some organisations might have a million dollars come in the door, but they build up infrastructure around that million dollars and then that million dollars isn't promised ongoing. So, you know, the, the idea of having an initiative that works, measuring it, and looking at the scalability of it, I think that there's, that there's also a question there around what's the right rate of growth if you can get hold of the funding. One of the things that... that um, that, you know, as tomorrow, man, we've taken a great interest in is how do you market the message and how do you, how do you language it in a way that actually cuts through and, and gets people's attention? So sometimes you've got a really, you know, great solution. It's research. You know that it has impact, but the communication of it can be really hard to get into a mainstream market and have the people that, you know, are the decision makers on funding and have access to those things are going to take notice of. So I think that coming together as a community and collaborating, um, partly it's about saying, how have you worked out to get the right people to listen? And, and, and how can we advise each other on how to take a really good, you know, positive, influential, you know, service or product and actually be able to communicate it in the right way so that people start spreading the word and going, hey, what they're doing works and let's actually get you in front of the right people so that this thing spreads easily. So I, I think it happens at both ends. Um, y yes, it's about trying to, you know, get, for some people, it's government. For some people, it's there's a lot of money in commercial organisations and more and more commercial organisations are needing to wake up and take a societal stance on some of the big issues that are facing our people. And so there is a bigger pocket of money that's opening up in that space to say, you know, who do I as a commercial organisation want to sponsor? 
um, you know, there's more of a societal groundswell of people that are willing to put their own money towards these things because they're impacted at the grassroots level by some of these stats. So I think that, you know, again, I'm just saying, I think that the conversation is great and collaborating, but talking about how all of the various pathways of funding and what's the recipe that seems to be able to get access to those various pools of funding, whether commercial organisations, commercial sector, government, whether it's, you know, the mums and dads, you know, and the grassroots people that want to see change in their community, um, you know, what are we learning about the best way to, you know, get the message through to people in a way that we can make the initiatives that already exist, collaborate, get better, learn from each other and, and create what we've been talking about on the front end of the conversation, which is this kind of, you know, societal shift rather than around the edges firefighting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah. Sorry. Hang, go on, ahead, John. Just... No, hang on, John. I'm, I'm, I'm going to just bring a bit of structure back so as we, as we, we've had a great brainstorm. I just need to bring a little bit of structure back as we, as we, as we bring the conversation uh to uh sadly to a close um but um before i do that germany jeremy 100 percent on the commitment of bringing people together as we've discussed it's uh, really important and, and the, it's really important the time is now that we we, we, we do that uh, from a political perspective with announcements with plans with general elections coming within 12 federal elections coming in 13 minutes 12 months really important that we, we we take that action very soon um to bring the conversation to a to a nice sort of like not a conclusion but a, but a resting point to the end of the chap this chapter this is a big book unfolding conversation with lots of chapters to the end of this particular chapter you guys have painted a really exciting um uh, vision of what men's health could look like in the, in the next 10 years We've each got a slightly different vision, but it's got a lot of similar components. Clearly, we all want change. One way we, we would measure it is a reduction in the amount of male suicide. But there's many other issues around violence and relationships and health and well-being and life expectancy and, and our work-life balance and, and our experiences of fatherhood and how we educate boys and, 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 and how, 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 we, how we develop uh, meaningful, lasting friendships. There's loads of different ways we could measure how we've improved men and boys' health in the next 10 years. But between us, we agree it's about individual change, of course, and individual growth, about becoming more emotionally intelligent across the piece. But it's about cultural change. It's, 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 it's a, and it's about systemic change. It's about change happening on multiple levels that can't just come from the grassroots up. And it can't just come from, from politicians and, and the top down. It needs to come from every area of society. As we grow and evolve and become a healthier, a healthier, happier community, right? So, so we've all got a kind of shared-ish vision of where we want to get to in 10 years. And, and Tom was talking about, you know, the challenges of funding there. Um, final thoughts on, on what's going to stop us getting there. What are, what's going to stop us? And do you have the answer to how we get past that barrier? Is it, is it individual resistance? Is it, is it our unwillingness to work together or our failure to work together? Is it simply just dollars? Is, is it funding? Is it political support? What, is it corporate support? What are the, what's the key? Just pick one. What's the key barrier for you? And, how, and, and, and then also, how can we overcome that barrier? And I'll come to you, Nick, and then John, and then Jeremy. Uh, well, we're talking about change and, and, and the work that we do here, we talk about five steps to change. The first one is awareness that there's a problem. The second one is an acceptance that we need to do something. The third one is motivation to change. Uh, and I can't work with clients until they tick those three things off and they get in my office. The fourth one is the tools. And I think that's where we're at now is providing men with the tools. And the fifth one is capacity. So increasing blokes capacity to look after themselves and then they're in a position where they can look after others so for me i mean once again from my little sector over here psychotherapy tends to fall through the gap you know funding goes to psychology and psychiatry and all these places there are so many lived experience practitioners now have gone to the school of life instead of you know doing double degrees and doctorates and all that sort of thing and we've got the rapport, we've got the understanding, we've, got the, we've been through it and come out the other side of it. So I think we need to be 
more of a factor in, in what's moving forward. And I think it says a lot that the general public and even first responders are choosing to dive into their own pocket and to pay you to come and do our programs instead of using mental health care plans or instead of using EAPs, you know, because they're not working. It's just, it's a cookie cutter system and it's not, you know, there's, there's three really important components to achieving a positive outcome. The first one is rapport. The second one is hope, you know, giving someone light at the end of the tunnel. And then the third step is that change process that I spoke about. So I think we can really just simplify it. We can tend to overcomplicate things. Let's simplify it. Let's just come back to just, you know, all right, let's just go through the steps to change. Uh, let's get the people involved who want to be there, who are passionate about it, and who have got something to contribute. And yeah, Bruce Lee, knowing is not enough, we must do. So let's just start actioning it and um, get around the table with that fine whiskey that Jez spoke about. I'm, yeah. I'm on board with that. Yeah. Your shout. Just two million dollars. Two million dollars. Like it... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah. Just do it like Bruce Lee from Nick. Uh, and, and also a little a little request for uh, Jeremy to share a little bit of his two million dollars, which we know he carries around in his back <laughs> pocket, obviously, because that's how these things work, right? Um, John, so, yeah, and uh, yeah, I don't want Jeremy's money. I want uh, the money of the big guys that seem to have been, you know, spending it all on on stuff that I I haven't seen on the ground yet. So, you know, I'd like a, an arrangement where we pick up a dollar for every. You know, every phone call they don't get, we get a dollar back, right, for the work we're doing, right? That'd be cool. But anyway, yeah, I, it, it's interesting. I love uh, what Nick was saying because people are choosing to grow and as a, and then have a personal impact on their on their circle of concern. So they change the world, you know, by by changing themselves and then and inviting others to you know to to benefit from that change. And I think that's where. Uh, where we're going to fall short, right? We're going to fall short if we don't invite, encourage, um, cajole, threaten, whatever it takes to bring people on board with this, right? It, it's one one thing I think I fight, you know, I'm on the Northern Beaches and, I, and we I look around and I fight the comfort of people, right? And uh, I was talking to a lived experience protect practitioner and you know, I asked the question, when do you, when are we going to make some ground? And he said, when everyone has a lived experience. And I hope we don't get to that point, right, where they have to suffer before they, they buy in. So I, I think let's make the call to people and give them, you know, and in, in innovatively and, in, and um, you know, passionately ask them to help us so that whenever, you know, so that when the, the, blo the blokes who are making decisions know um, that this is part of what they have to do, right? They have to reach out and help community help and help themselves, right? So I think it, our biggest obstacle will be to convince people that this is a journey they have to take and it's both for themselves and for everyone else. And um, right. I, Thanks, I, I, John. Yeah. Yeah. Jazz, barriers, overcoming them. Barriers refers to a couple of Tom spoke about this about funding. We get our two million, um, which is over four years. I'll get to that in 10 seconds. But we also get funding from donations, um, funding from companies that have been a bit naughty and have to donate some money to us. So we, you know, that that two million covers two PHN regions. We've got to justify every other place I go to through big corporates, you know, big businesses, big building companies. So any sort of gather gathering we get together and talk about how to build this, how to do all that sort of stuff has to have the stuff that Tom talked about, the governance and the structure and the finance. Nick, a big barrier, mate, is that that two million, by the time that PHN take out their bit and then I have to acquit it and my accountant and insurance and petrol. So one of them is a lot. Um, so I haven't got any of that two million available for whiskey, but I'm surely going to sh sh share to you a nice bottle when I catch up with you. So knowledge, experience, and bureaucracy. So for me, I do talk about wow, I've got two million, but I can tell you the stress and the pressure of having that over four years and everything that increases that goes with that can potentially drive me a bit bunter at times. So for me, I think anything, any barriers 
um, for me is around bureaucracy and the layers of bureaucracy and how they do it and how there's apparently no change available and the people in the sector that are just in it for a good six-figure crust, those people drive me quite get me quite angry um so for me it's around bureaucracy glenn and you know i i you know, appealed to greg hunt very lovely and nicely about cutting through a bit of that layers and he very gratefully did otherwise i don't know if i would have taken it on mate it really can be very heartbreaking and sad the amount of time and energy and and lobbying we shouldn't have to friggin lobby sorry state and federal governments for this I do. I've had nothing from the state, federal, Victorian state government in seven years, and I've done hundreds of events. They should be coming to us, mate. They should be reaching out to us. Whether it's Suicide Prevention Australia, I don't hear from them. I, th there's a disconnect there. So for me, there needs to be a bit more collaboration on all levels, and and they should be coming to us a little bit. They're allowed to, mate. We're we're, we're good people, and we're the salt of the earth. Right. I'm I'm going to go and uh, be quiet. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jazz. So look, um, often at this point, we turn to those listening, those watching, and we ask you to tell the people watching what to do. What's your three things you want them to do? Or what's your one big ask? Do you know what? I ain't going to do that. What I'm going to actually ask is I'm going to make it, bring it right down to the individual and to the personal. I'm going to ask you, ask you all, um, what can we depend on you to do for men's health in the next I don't know, next year or next two years, even the next 10 years if you want, but keep it simple. What can we depend on you to do in the next uh, in the next year? And I'll come to uh, John first. Yeah, that is fabulous. You can depend on me to um, to grow in, you know, because I I am addicted to, to connecting with the, the wisdom I see here and, and across the board whenever I reach out to blokes who are doing something. And um, as a consequence, I personally grow and, and, and learn and um, I'm just addicted to that. And I think that helps, right? So you can depend on me for that. Um, you can depend on me for, to be all in on uh, working with the, the, the groups that I've got um, going now and with a passion to grow them, right? So uh, I believe every bloke in the country needs a mentor or access to one. Um, I, need, I believe uh, on a local level, the organisations within our community need to come together and support each other. And I think those missions are all part of the same thing, which is like we, we all need to be all in to help each other, you know. And uh, yeah. the third thing, I, 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 third thing you can depend on me to do is to, um, is to <laughs> hold people accountable, right? You know, the, 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 I'm going to ask um, the, the members, the people who make decisions about this stuff, I'm going to ask them to, to remember that they are part of the human race and that humans need um, love, connection and, um, and care and to be listened to and that, you know, that uh, material things, you know, uh, are not a priority over us. So, Right. Thanks, John. Good to know we can depend on you for those things. Nick <laughs> Sutherland, what, what can we depend on you for? Um, you can count on me to, to keep myself in a position where I can keep being of service for those in need. Um, I'm, you know, I used to have a utopian belief that I want to create as big of a positive ripple of effect as I can in the world. But there are so many people out there that don't want it, that don't think they need it. Um, so, once again, and everyone's on their own journey. But for those who are looking for it, I, I guarantee I'll be here for you and for them, and I will give away everything that I currently possess um, in terms of intellectual property and and wisdom that I've accumulated through my own experience and through talking with other wonderful people. Um, there's an abundance of resource out there and and so i, would, I just want to keep giving to, to those searching so I'll, I'll, I'll continue to be a resource for those you know needing it thanks nick great response jeremy forbes what can we depend on you for um i'm getting a kitten on monday <laughs> i'm more of a cat person you're seeing i'm very excited you depend on me being very loving to my kitten 
You can also depend on me to keep ranting and being emotional. I've been like this for eight years, mate. I can promise you that. So um, advocation, what did I write down there? Energy, enthusiasm, uh, and still going out and doing stuff for nothing for communities and just showing people that we care. And I'll still follow Collingwood and um, I'm going to be nice to my kitten. But I, I'm, I'm also, yes, very passionate, as you all know, and you, you can you can lock that one in, mate, um, for the next 12 months and hopefully expand Holt as well. That's what I want to do and get Beautiful. out to the communities. I'll bring my kitten with me. Go passion, Collingwood, and kittens, and not necessarily in that order. Can I just tell you something quickly? Is that my my sister has a cat as well, and um, her and I are thinking when the cat's big enough to get a little cat pram, so I can take the cat around. Yep, take the cat around the streets of Castlemaine. So in a pram, maybe cats in Castlemaine in a pram. You heard it here first, folks. Uh, it's gender equality, mate. We need cat blokes as well as cat ladies. <laughs> that's that's very true. There I have go. cat t-shirts. Don't worry about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Why does dog have to be man's best friend? Why can't yeah. cat be man's best friend? There's Absolutely. another whole, that's a whole other event for next year. That's specious. Tom yeah. it is Tom Tom <laughs> Hawking. Um, <laughs> it's an interesting question. Um I uh we've been going for about kind of five years in this current form. What I mean by that is tomorrow, man. Um, a lot of us have kind of been doing work, not under that banner before that, but we, we were really privileged when, when man up the documentary launched to have a platform. Um, and, and, you know, through continuing to try and learn and grow and get better, We've kind of gone, you know, at, at this point, we're running about a thousand workshops a year, you know, between Tomorrow Man and Tomorrow Woman. If, if I admire your kind of courage and energy, Jeremy, because if somebody had said to me like five years ago, oh, you can click a button and this is the impact and this is how many people will be in your organization, this will be the budget of the organization, I would have said, no, thank you like that is just terrifying and I don't want it and I don't know how to do that. Um, and so my, my commitment is more around, I think scale is scary. I find it scary scale, the, the growing of responsibility and the growing, you know, complexity of having a bigger and bigger impact on more and more people. Now we've been talking a lot about collaboration and that makes it less scary when you're in there together but my commitment is to keep putting one foot in front of the other and try and learn and grow and, and to continue to keep an eye on systemic change um, and, and to continue to kind of believe that um, the stats can change. And, you know, to what Nick's been saying in the chapter, I've loved what you've been throwing out there. Um, you know, that the aspirational, you know, model of what a good life looks like for a man and a woman is realized more often. Um, sometimes when you think about trying to do it at scale, it gets daunting. But my commitment is just, you know, one foot in front of the other. And, and I make that on behalf of everybody involved in our organization. Um, just one foot in front of the other, trying to learn and grow to have more and more impact. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm learning so much I've learned on this call, you know, I often feel pretty humbled being in these kind of forums and being a speaker. So I'm like, what, what do I know? Like, like there are people whose names I can see on this that aren't speakers that know so much more than I do about this space and about gender and about policy. And so I think just trying to humbly keep foot putting a step forward and, and build your knowledge base and and grow your capacity and courage to have impact um that's that's kind of what i want to keep at not get overwhelmed by the whole thing um and great. keep some optimism and energy great thanks tom thanks for sharing that and thanks for uh, thanks for your your um your, your humility and uh, for being an inspiration at the same time too um so look i, I guess i should take it myself as well and uh, for me um you know, talking about the complexity and the scale of all the stuff we're trying to take on, which can be overwhelming, um, Tom, 
No, I sometimes sometimes joke, you know, because I come from an I also come from an international perspective. So all I do is I'm just interested in transforming the lives of uh, you know of, of, of men and boys because seven billion people is too many. So I just focus on three point five, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> and then and then to simplify it, really, you know, because I mean, I'm I'm very well aware that I personally can't be responsible for you know any any large number of, uh, of 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 men and boys' lives, but I can make a contribution. And and to me, what I'm trying to do is create a world where uh, um, what unifies all the work I do is I'm trying to create a world where every every man and boy and every woman and girl and everyone of any gender identity, to be, to be quite frank, is just one conversation away from whatever help and support they need. And, and, and that that's the magic piece for me. It's about us building a world where everyone is just one conversation away from whatever help and support they need. And in this interconnected world, there's actually multiple ways that we could do that. And so my, my commitment is is to keep connecting organizations and people in this space because you know we're out there trying to connect men and boys to great services and great help and great support and and often we forget to 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 or just don't have the time and the space and the energy to connect to each other and sometimes i find that work frustrating because you know i want to be at the grassroots more i want to be actually in there helping the individual blokes which i've done at different times in my career um, and I sometimes wonder, what am I doing in these rooms or at this strategy level, this policy level? It seems so far removed from the action and the cold face. But um, events like this remind me that it's really vital that we create networks and we connect to people doing the work. Uh, and, 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 and someone's got to do that. An organisation has got to do that. So my commitment with my Australian Men's Health Forum hat on is I'll keep working to connect uh, people like yourselves. And on a personal level, that's what energizes me. I found today's, uh, I found it tough being on Zoom the last couple of days. It's been a lot of work. And some of the sessions, it's been really hard to pull people there because they're not necessarily coming from a kind of collective perspective. We've been talking to health sector workers and policy thinkers and researchers and who aren't always connected. But today, I've got that real sense of being part of a family. You know, some of you have known for a long time. Some have just known your names and not known you that well. But we are a we are we are a family. We're a sector. We're a movement. We're a community. And we're all we all have different opinions, but we are, are joined by our commitment to make a difference uh, for 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 men and boys. So um, my commitment is I'll keep connecting us. So there we come up to four thirty. I don't know about you watching this or you speaking on it, but I've had a fantastic. Sometimes at the end of these things, you feel more tired than when you started, and sometimes you feel more energized. And today's definitely one of those days where I feel more energized. Thank you for your passion and energy. You've made a difference to this man's mental well being today. And I'm sure you'll continue to make a difference to lots of men's mental well being. Jeremy Forbes from Holt, Nick Sutherland from MindFit and the Work Blokes podcast, John Milham from Mentoring Men, Tom Harking from Tomorrow Man. Thank you. You have been an awesome panel. That is the end of the session.